All right, well, welcome and thank you for joining us for our seminar, Grand Rounds Optimizing Environmental Public Health Practice with Geographic Information Systems. My name is Nicole Dutra. I'm a Senior Project Coordinator here at the National Environmental Health Association, or NEHA for short, and I will be your host today. To begin today's seminar, I will provide a brief overview of who the National Environmental Health Association is and what we do. Then I will introduce today's moderator who will introduce our speakers, and they have an amazing presentation planned for you today. A short Q&A will be provided following their presentation, then we will introduce our panel experts and then move into a discussion session. And again, you will be able to submit any questions that you have for them as well. After the discussion session, I will provide a few final announcements on some upcoming opportunities. With that, allow me to cover a few housekeeping items before we get started. Please note that this seminar is being recorded. The seminar recording will be uploaded onto the NEHA Environmental Health Grand Rounds webpage. You can also find all of our recordings for all of our previous Grand Rounds seminars there as well. Uh, if you have any questions for our speakers during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A to submit your questions and we will attend to them after the presentation. In addition, if you have any questions for our panelists during the discussion session, also use the Q&A to submit your questions. You can find the option for Q&A in your screen's Zoom controls next to the chat option. At the conclusion of the seminar, you will receive a link to take part in an evaluation survey to provide feedback, comments, or additional inquiries on today's seminar. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with NEHA, allow me to provide a brief overview of who we are. As an association, everything we do is to build, sustain, and empower environmental public health professionals so that they are equipped and prepared to protect the health of communities across the country. We support the environmental public health workforce by continuously providing the most up-to-date training, tools, and resources for the many different fields considered environmental public health. NEHA is focused on increasing knowledge and skills, building workforce capacity, efficiency, and effectiveness. We have a longstanding history in credentialing and providing continuing education credits. In addition to our large online library of trainings, seminars, and available tools and resources, we host an annual educational conference, which includes multiple sessions focused on the many different fields of environmental public health, including food safety, private water, on-site wastewater, data and informatics, climate and health, natural disasters and emergency response, policy regulation, and so many more. It is important to note that no matter where you are in your educational journey or professional career, NEHA has something for you. Membership provides environmental public health students and professionals with opportunities to make new connections and obtain specialized training and education to support your growth and advancement in the field of environmental public health. Check out our website to learn more. Now, let's continue with our seminar. Allow me to introduce today's moderator, Carla Shoup. Carla is the Environmental Health Manager at Southern Nevada Health District. She obtained her undergraduate degree in zoology from the University of Washington and her master's in public health from the University of Nevada, Reno. She has over 17 years of experience as a registered environmental health specialist and has been managing inspection teams for aquatic health institutions, child care, body art, and plan review for five years. Ms. Shoup is currently the co-chair for the NEHA Informatics Committee. She loves environmental health as a, as a career path and wishes she had found it sooner. Carla, I will now hand the floor over to you. Great, thanks Nicole and thanks to everybody for uh, joining us this morning. I'm gonna start by introducing our uh, presenters this morning. Uh, as the GIS lead at the San Bernardino County Department of Public Health, Serene Ong applies over 20 years of GIS experience to oversee the department's GIS team and guides GIS strategy, infrastructure, security, and best practices. 
She specializes in spatial data analysis and leveraging geospatial technology to inform public health decisions. Serene focuses on transforming complex data into accessible formats, supporting policy development, and advancing health equity. Her efforts are directed towards improving operational efficiency and enhancing health service delivery across the county. We also have Andrew Mackey, GIS analyst with the San Bernardino County Department of Public Health, Spatial Analytics, Data and Epidemiology and Environmental Health Services Division. Wow, that's a mouthful, Andrew, thanks. Andrew holds a Bachelor's of Science in Applied Mathematics, a Master's in Public Policy, and a Master's in Economics. He began his career as a graduate student researcher focusing on data analysis and GIS on human health and climate. For the past three years, he's been with San Bernardino County, initially as a statistical analyst in environmental health, and now as a GIS analyst. His role includes building dashboards, maps, apps, and automated workflows to support departmental objectives. Welcome, Serene and Andrew. Take it away. All right, Andrew, you could go ahead and, and share your slides. Can everybody see that? I do not see it. We can see you, Andrew. How about now? We could see it. It's in, oh, perfect. You got it. All right, let me get started. Hello, everyone. We're very honored to be here. And I'm here with my colleague, Andrew Mackey. And we're excited to share how we have used GIS within our environment, environmental health services program. First, to give you some context, San Bernardino County is in Southern California. And with over 20,000 square miles, it stands as the largest county in the continental US. Uh, Andrew, would you? Yeah, there we go, uh, in the US. And we also have a geographically diverse landscape. So the county presents unique challenges in environmental health management. With over 15,000 facilities that need inspections spread over a large area and with different frequencies of inspections, our inspectors spend a lot of time on the road traveling to these facilities in the cities, countrysides, mountains, and deserts. A drive to one of our father cities takes about three and a half hours one way. So the scale of our operations and their geographic challenges underscores the importance of efficient and effective resource allocation and how to better overcome these challenges than with the help of a geographic information system or GIS. So what is, what is GIS? It's a system and technology that helps us capture, analyze and present data in the spatial context. And that turns the data into actionable information. It's also people and processes who are involved at every step from the subject matter experts to those collecting and analyzing the data, making the decisions to those implementing actions, policies, and workflows. It's also platforms and software that we use the technology on. We have GIS online, on the desktop, and on, on mobiles, mobile applications on mobile devices. So that makes it a very powerful tool. And finally, it enables us to visualize, interpret, and understand what's on the ground and the relationships of what's around us. It helps us streamline our workflows and makes it helps us make better decisions on workload distribution. So the work that we do uses ArcGIS software on the Esri platform. So you will hear us mention some product specific names in this presentation. And let me talk about our data. Much like other environmental health organizations, we use data from many sources. We have in-house data that our inspectors gather, that residents provide when applying for or renewing permits. And we also have secondary data that we get from state agencies like the Regional Water Quality Control Board and other authoritative sources about our populations like the California Healthy Places Index or the HPI. And I will talk about a little bit more about that one later. Of course, we have data for administrative boundaries like zip codes, cities, unincorporated areas, supervisor districts, and census tracts. And we also create our own district, uh, our own districts, which again, you'll hear about later. 
We automate and update our data via Python scripts, pushing data from our EHS database to RGIS Online, which then updates our maps, apps, and dashboards. So now let's see some specific programs and applications. As mentioned before, our county has a large range of geographic features and hence a range of emergencies and disasters, from snowstorms to strong winds to fires and earthquakes. When an emergency happens, our environmental health services team have the charge to contact impacted or possibly impacted permitted facilities, check if they are all right, and assess damage to, to find if they are able to function safely or if they should stop operations until damage has been repaired and operations can safely resume. One example here in Southern California, a combination of strong winds, overhead power lines, and dry conditions makes for high fire risk. In times of strong winds, our electric company does a public safety power shutoff or PSPS. This closes circuits and causes power outages in those areas. In the case of power outages, and where food facilities food sits unrefrigerated for some time and cannot be used, our teams provide information on safe disposal of spoiled food or stop operations. Our emergency response map includes a layer of all the power circuits and a layer of our permitted facilities. We can select those circuits which are down and find the facilities that are in them and quickly provide a list to our, our food inspection team to start contacting those facilities. We have had in recent years also winter storms, fires, and even a hurricane, and use similar techniques using areas impacted by those disasters to inform our inspection teams of possible, possibly impacted facilities. I'll turn you over to Andrew now for, for pool safety. Thank you, Serene. Uh, within, <clears throat> within our community environmental health program, pool inspections are conducted through multiple rotations throughout the summer months. To streamline this process, we leverage ArcGIS workforce for supervisors to assign pool and spa facilities to field staff. Utilizing this platform, field staff can conveniently access their, uh, their assignments via their uh, mobile phones. Additionally, they utilize ArcGIS Navigator to efficiently route to their designated destinations. During inspections, we use ArcGIS Survey123 on mobile devices to collect field data. This data seamlessly integrates into our dashboard, enabling supervisors to monitor progress in real time. Furthermore, we use Microsoft Power Automate to automate email and text notifications to supervisors in case of specific safety concerns. For instance, notifications are triggered if a pool gate fails to close properly or if a pool light is found to be broken. This ensures timely responses to address any potential hazards. Uh, moving on to redistricting. So within environmental health, our various programs are organized into inspector districts to effectively manage and distribute workload. With some programs having as few as four inspectors and others nearly 30, maintaining equitable distribution is important. And every few years, we undertake the task of redistricting and, and ensuring these districts are balanced. To achieve this, we use ArcGIS Pro, utilizing program-specific historical average inspection times and drive times. By leveraging this data, we can create time-balanced districts based on total minutes spent, ensuring fairness and efficiency in workload distribution. For instance, with our, within our Community Environmental Health Program, we currently manage 30 districts. As illustrated on the top of this slide, these districts are carefully structured to achieve rough equality in time distribution, which you can understand from looking at the bar chart for each district. This approach optimizes our resources and enhances our ability to deliver effective services to our community. For the mosquito and vector control program, not only did we use GIS for re redistricting as Andrew just described, we also have maps for water sources and mosquito traps that our vector control technicians can view in mobile devices to inform their routine inspections and collections in the field. So when a technician goes out for the day's work, they know their districts and the locations of the items that they must visit. On another app, our customer services team who take complaint calls for the vector control program also have an ArcGIS map app that allows them to search the location of the complaint, find out the, the vector district uh, inspection district, and then can assign that complaint to the appropriate vector control technician. Also, in, an, in a dashboard for EHS managers, we map complaints like mosquitoes, bed bugs, rodents, etc. We also display a count of the complaints by type and by city. 
And finally, we'd like to talk a bit about health equity. Vector Control receives complaints calls from county residents. And when we did an analysis of who mainly made those phone calls, it was strongly correlated with homeowners. But in looking at improving the health of our communities, we needed to take a more proactive stance. Our Vector team asked to look at data of areas where renters and areas of low income were. We brought in a layer of data called the HPI, or the California Healthy Places Index, developed by the Public Health Alliance of Southern California, which is a coalition of public health leaders that aims to advance health equity. The HPI is a tool that measures and maps by census tracts the health advantages and disadvantages of neighborhoods across California using indicators such as economic, educational, housing, and environmental factors to guide public health and policy efforts towards areas in greatest need. Mapping complaints against this layer, our vector team then took action with having health education specialists go to those low HPI areas which showed little to no complaints and provided health and provided them with health education about mosquitoes and provided our call line number and empowering those people to make calls for services. Now, normally you would think that receiving an increase in complaints would be a bad thing, but this was a good thing in our view as we knew that people were suffering silently and we wanted to empower them. From these actions, we saw a 10% increase in complaint calls from the lowest HPI areas from 2021 to 2022. Now let's talk about street vending. Unpermitted street vending has become a high profile issue in our state as a recent law changed to allow street vending. But while this is legal, food vendors on the streets still must comply with food safety regulations. Our code enforcement agency and our food inspection program needed a solution to track unpermitted street vendors and to document their locations and our own staff's actions to take uh, our own staff's actions taken in the field. We set up a mobile app survey for staff going into street vending events so that they could easily collect data. And I'll hand you now to Andrew, who will tell you about the survey. Um, our staff utilizes Survey123 on their mobile devices for gathering information related to food safety standards, such as the presence of refrigeration units, availability of hand washing stations, and possession of health permits by the vendors. Additionally, our, sur uh, our survey tracks instances of health education provided by field staff, contributing to our community outreach efforts. One of the key functionalities of the survey is the ability for staff to accurately pinpoint their location on the map. This, features in this feature enables precise geolocation tagging, allowing for detailed mapping and analysis of street vending activities. By harnessing the capabilities of Survey123, we enhance our data collection processes and gain valuable insights into street vending operations within the county. Now I'll pass it back to Serene to cover the dashboard and map functionalities associated with this data collection effort. Once we had the data from the map, from the field, we were able to map it out and put that along with other key metrics, which were gathered from the field into a dashboard to show program managers and our county leaders. This data shown in this way has been a powerful tool to show the extent of this situation and also measure and show in numbers and maps the work that our staff have done, going to the street vendors, engaging with them, providing health education, and showing them requirements on how to be permitted. Next, we'll talk about the Land Use Protection Program. The Land Use Protection Program map was created to help well technicians in the review process of the well permit applications. It also aids in locating all the well systems under the local primary agency jurisdiction as well as helping the land use wastewater section review their plans. This map has data layers for parcels, townships, range, and sections, water agencies, sanitation districts, solid waste sites, and many more. It also has tools for searching areas by address, parcel numbers, parcel owner names, and latitude and longitude. And it also has satellite imagery for, review for viewing elements on the ground. Our wastewater program is responsible for overseeing the safe and environmentally sound treatment and disposal of wastewater, ensuring that septic systems and other on-site wastewater treatment facilities comply with uh, health and safety regulations to protect public health and the environment. Annually, we compile a local area management program or LAMP report supplemented by a comprehensive five-year overview. To enhance our reporting capabilities, we've developed a dashboard as a supplementary data analysis tool for the five-year LAMP report. 
This dashboard offers insights into historical nitrate and nitrite measurements across the three water boards within our county, which are the Santa Ana, La Hontan, and Colorado regions. Moreover, the dashboard provides valuable information on the locations of new and repaired on-site wastewater treatment systems. This dashboard has the ability to filter data by year, water board region, data source, and by unincorporated versus un, uh, incorporated areas. In addition to the GIS solutions that we have presented, we also build dashboards and maps to monitor key performance indicators for each program. Here are just a few of the other dashboards that we have built for environmental health. Uh, for example, we have a plan check dashboard that tracks plan review turnaround time and monthly volume of plans, a water dashboard that tracks service request turnaround time and district staff inspection progress, and a housing, apartment, massage, and medical waste dashboard that tracks public complaints and district staff inspection progress. All of these dashboards are tied together and organize an environmental health performance hub, which was built using ArcGIS Experience Builder. This is a one-stop shop for EHS managers to view the health, performance, and productivity of all of our programs. Finally, this allows management and leadership to access these dashboards in one easy and convenient location with just one URL. And that concludes our presentation. We'd like to thank all the people who are part of this work. We could not have done it and would not be here speaking about that work. This is also their work. These people are everyone in EHS, from their inspectors and technicians in the field, to supervisors and managers, and the division chief, and the customer support staff. They are also the amazing database and IT team that maintain and provide all the tools and data that we need. We also like to thank our department director and others in the county that collaborate and support us, like the county ITB and code enforcement. And lastly, thank you, Niha, for inviting us here today. So now we'll have a few questions, a uh, few minutes for questions and answers. If there are any questions we don't get to, please feel free to email us at this email address on the slide. Great presentation, Serene and Andrew. Thank you so much. I love your dashboards. Um, we do have a couple questions. We'll try and get through a couple of them now. Um, one question was, what inspection software and database does San Bernardino use? It's a variety, uh, I would say. For food inspections, they use uh, um, a software called Envision, which is specialized for environmental health services. And they enter their data directly on, uh, on like iPads or mobile devices directly into the Envision uh, database. And then for mosquito um, and vector control, like you saw, um, we actually use um, Collector, which will be now turned into a field app um, for the field. And that is an ArcGIS um, uh, software by Esri. And we're gonna have time for one more question. And then I'm gonna ask Serene and Andrew just to um, help answer some of these questions later through at the end of the presentation. Uh, but in the meantime, is the use of survey one, two, three data in addition to data entered into the EH database or are they synced together somehow? You want to take that one, Andrew? Uh, sure. Yeah, these would be two separate data sources. For example, the street vending project, all of our data is stored within survey, uh, survey one, two, three, and that's uh, hosted on ArcGIS online on the cloud. So they're 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 separate. They're not synced together. Uh, but you know, ArcGIS dashboards. You know, you have the ability to bring in multiple uh, different data sources, and you can combine them in a dashboard. Um, so yeah, yeah, they're they're separate. Great, thank you. Well, now we're going to move on to our panel discussion, and I'm going to introduce you to our very distinguished group of experts. Um, Kanita Sellers is a GIS analyst with the King County GIS Center in Seattle, Washington. She has more than 15 years of experience in providing GIS analysis and mapping services to various private agencies and governments. Her experience includes data collection, management, and analysis using ArcGIS Pro, ArcGIS Online, Feature Manipulation Engine, Python, and SQL. She has developed various web applications and dashboards to help automate monitoring for critical decision-making. She promotes environmental health justice by addressing at-risk areas to attain health for all. 
Next, we have Dr. Gagandeep Gill. I hope I didn't mess your name up too much. He's a distinguished public health researcher and professor currently serving as senior health research analyst at Memorial Care Health System in Southern California and as an assistant professor. He boasts an impressive educational background with a Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry from UCLA and advanced degrees in public health in biostatistics and preventive care from Loma Linda University. His extensive research experience includes contributions to the Adventist Health Study, collaborations on the Masala Study with UCSF and LLU, and working on the RFFM grant with the FDA. Dr. Gill has also held pivotal roles as a statistician for San Bernardino County of Public Health, the GIS analyst, and the director of clinical safety for FQHC Clinica Sierra Vista, showcasing his wide-ranging expertise in both research and practical applications in public health. Finally, we have Nanette Starr, who is a descendant from the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and is a distinguished public health expert, renowned for her profound dedication to environmental health and equity. Currently serving as the Director of Policy and Planning at the California Consortium for Urban Indian Health, Nanette holds a Master's of Public Health degree from George Mason University, specializing in environmental health. With extensive experience in policy analysis and program management, Nanette has spearheaded initiatives addressing the unique environmental health challenges faced by urban Indian communities. Notably, she directed policy systems and built environment projects. Let me start that over. Notably, she directed policy systems and built environment projects with tribes, including initiatives such as building community gardens, establishing youth training programs on clam gathering, and supporting sustainable activities. Her expertise extends to GIS, empowering her to deliver insightful presentations on the intersection of GIS technology and environmental health advocacy. So welcome, panelists. Let's go ahead and get the discussion going, starting with our first question, which I'm gonna to direct to Kanita. Kanita, how does GIS enable more efficient workflows? So GIS helps streamline processes and it helps with decision-making. Like for example, I review septic system data and what I'm looking for um, is septic systems that have failed or within a certain age range, um, usually around the 20 year um, mark. We end up mapping this data so that we can try to find a clustered of failed septic systems or septic system that hits a certain criteria when it comes to age. Perfect. Uh, do any of the other panelists wanna comment on this or add to this question? Sure, I'm happy to add to this. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, um, so I also uh, have a history of serving as assistant director for one, a county public health department out of California. And during that time, we definitely utilize GIS for workflows. We live in a very, very rural Northern California county. So being able to um, actually send some of our inspectors out, whether it's for um, inspecting wells or restaurants or some of our ponds that ended up having high um, amounts of red algae, they wouldn't have to then drive back where previously they would have to, to drive back all the way to the office, which was about 50 miles at least. And I know in San Bernardino, and so Serene can share about this, it's even further. So some of these larger counties, it's really impactful. So the efficient workflow really has to do with also not having to to go back and forth in order to get that data. So really relying on that real-time information in that data gathering. Um, and it, it also enables folks to, um, to respond immediately. Thank you. Dr. Gill, can you discuss how GIS can be used to evaluate environmental factors that enhance public health? Definitely. <clears throat> As uh, you know, Serene and Andrew kind of mentioned, I mean, there's so many factors they were able to bring in other data, uh, HPI data, right, and and link it to the population itself. And when you can link it to the population itself, you can understand the environment in which everyone lives in um, and, 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 and have further questions for research or um, further development of more dashboards or more data to collect. 
Annette, can you talk about how GIS fosters interagency collaboration? Yeah, I have a few examples um, of that at the state level. Um, I was working with CDPH for a little while and um, focused on health equity in particular and health and all policies. And so being able to um, have an opportunity for everyone to come to the same table in a way that's not super scary. So all of you, it sounds like a lot of folks that are on the call front, because I'm looking at the chats, are um, definitely GIS people or environmental health people. And oftentimes we want a way to connect with one another and have that conversation. But there's oftentimes, especially at the state and federal level and even counties, there's a lot of bureaucracy in the way. So being able to come together in order to um, share, going back to the previous question, uh, being able to um, streamline some of the workflows, you know, making things a little more efficiency means that we're relying on that interagency collaboration so that everyone can help boost some of the work that's coming out. And, and I keep thinking about San Bernardino specifically because I'm definitely very familiar with that. So I'm going to highlight that a little bit more. Um, but I know that they have worked across the public health department as well as environmental health. And for them, it's actually separate. And so um, in the county that I also um, was over, uh, so at the county level, we we're working with the JS department, which is actually an IT. And in a lot of counties, it's actually under IT, which means that there needs to be a bridge to build that interagency collaboration. So I'm not saying it's easy, but I feel like GIS is like the safe place we can all go to have that conversation and talk about data and talk about, I need to create a map. I have this question. I'm trying to solve it. And, or I want to share with board of supervisors in order to get blank passed. So how do I do that? Well, we already know that um, a map is worth like a thousand pictures. They say pictures worth a thousand words. So it just gets better from there. So I just think there's a lot of opportunity there for fostering that interagency collaboration through the use of wanting to collaborate to build that map. It also really helps all different departments minimize some of their um, resources and work productivity when they can work together because everyone has their own strengths. And a lot of these organizations and a lot of departments are doing the same work. So going back to the health equity um, at the state of California, it's actually the water resource board that has like a really robust GIS system, which you might imagine being the water resource board, but they're because they're on the health and all policies coalition, they are helping to use their um, GIS in order to integrate data from other departments to guide health equity work across multiple topics, not just water. So it's pretty interesting to see even where it can go when there's just like someone who says, well, I have the platform and you know, I have some user licenses or I have a really good dashboard that's already built and then you can start using it for other work. Thank you. Yeah, and along those lines, what types of data sharing challenges have you encountered? I'm going to start with Nanette because you're kind of on that topic and then I'd like the other panelists to jump in as well. Well, um, I'm glad you asked because then I can bring in a lot of examples of tribes. So there's a lot of data sharing challenges. So in public health, um, and it was actually during COVID that I was over the, the public health department, you could imagine um, with HIPAA compliance and things like that. So there's a lot of the basic that you would already know are data sharing challenges, but I'm gonna take this down to the tribal level and really emphasize the data sovereignty component and, and especially just talking about public, um, public health as well as environmental health topics. When we're looking at, um, I have two examples for you and then I'll stop. But one example is I worked on food sovereignty and in that capacity, we tribes were, this was in um, Oregon and Washington, they're wanting to map where their different food locations are, but it's really important that they are um, not only because of data sovereignty, that they are protecting of their data, but also when data gets in the wrong hands, it can be used for things that either they don't want. And I'm bringing up the food part because um, one of one specific example I have is being able to track well, where all the harvesting top areas are for some really good traditional foods. And the this tribe in particular is just outside of the Portland area. So anyone who's ever been to Portland, Oregon, it's a foodie place. So their chefs want to go get that really good food, 
but those are protective sacred sites that belong to the tribes. And so there ends up being a lot of intricacies there about what's available and what's not. And I also had one other example of, um, I guess I, I would just leave with the county and state that there's public facing, uh, like at the environmental health department, we need to have some data on our dashboards but we also want to have some things that we're tracking internally regarding metrics in order to make sure that we're holding ourselves accountable that might not be external. So that would also be another data sharing component. Anita, any data sharing challenges? I would say um, some of the personal information of users um, for events that are hosted by environmental health. Um, not being able to um, share like their address information so that we can have like a general idea as far as where people are coming from when we host an event. And uh, I would say also during COVID, we distributed um, HIPAA filters and not being able to have a detailed address as far as like where the location was, as far as like where the HIPAA units were distributed at, we just had to um, use the zip code of the facility. And that was it. Dr. Gill, any thoughts? Yeah, a, a lot of um, sharing challenges because, you know, as, as kind of Annette pointed out too, it, you know, it's sensitive data. It could be interpreted in multiple ways. So we want to make sure that whenever someone wants to share, it's interpreted the correct way. The message isn't, you know, derailed and taken in a different context. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, let's see, Kanita, how do you, well, this kind of goes along the same lines. Um, maybe you can all jump in on this as well. Um, how do privacy issues restrict use or distribution of GIS data? Are we just going back to, you know, protecting uh, personal addresses or are there other other concerns? Um, no, I stated the privacy issues that we um, are currently encountering. Dr. Gill, can you provide any examples of when GIS drove policy decisions? Oh, yeah, a lot. Um, there's a lot of examples. Um, Mainly because, I mean, if you're looking at just particularly environmental decisions or like um, looking at a population, you know, it's underserved, you know, funding needs to be there. So you can map it out geographically, know the areas and, and then funding and can be given to those areas. Um, so that's one of the biggest aspects, giving investment, investing into areas that are mostly deprived. Um, so that's been the biggest thing. Then that drives policy because then, you know, funding can can address those needs. Great, I'm gonna jump into the Q&A here. It's, I'm being told there's lots of questions. So uh, let's start with this one. Any progress or application of GIS in food outbreak surveillance and how might it support migrating such issues? Anybody have any thoughts? On I'm, that? I'm happy to jump in there and then just see what other examples folks have. But there's quite a few. Um, and just as a background, I worked for Esri for a while. So that's a lot of the information that I'm coming from is multiple stories from multiple counties and states. But being able to actually have some inspectors that are out in the field. So this going back to that first question you asked about the efficiency and the workflow process. But with food outbreaks, we actually want someone to go. And oftentimes you have to go from one restaurant to another or or you have to go talk with um, individuals who went to a specific restaurant. So it depends on where the outbreak is identified. And this is where we can get back into, I saw there's a lot of questions about survey one, two, three. That's a really great example to ask basic questions. It's also something that you can post on the web. And so you can just, you could also send a link to maybe people that were all at the same restaurant or that are listed as a uh, shopping at a specific place in order to do some of this tracking. So there's a lot of opportunity to ease that workflow and get real time information in order to put it down. And then um, you're able to get to hopefully where the um, outbreak began a lot quicker as well as follow-ups. People always wanna know follow-ups and like if it was a restaurant, did they fix what they needed to? And then you can, of course, use dashboards and share that information online as well. 
Uh, Kanita, this one might be pertinent for you. How does your GIS programming help EH staff support homeowners and renters with use of private well systems? Um, can you say it again? I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, how does your GIS programming help EH staff support homeowners and renters with use of private well systems? So I have not um, spent a lot of time. Well, our GIS um, department is fairly new. Um, so I've only been in my position for about two years. So I do know that we have some of the well data that is mapped. We and we're in the process of still updating the data. The data, as far as I know, it's not available for the public um, release. I believe it's more of internal, um, but the data is there for internal candidates to evaluate like where wells are located at. Yeah, that was a conversation that we actually had um, in my organization about, we were trying to figure out what information should be public and what information we would only wanna hold internally. Um, so I don't know if any of you have any thoughts on um, complaints, for instance. Complaints sometimes come in from the public, they contain you know, personal information, rude comments, whatever. Um, and then like what type of information would, would be beneficial to have on the public side versus the internal side. I mean, I'm happy to jump in. I don't want to keep <laughs> talking about it. I have examples. Uh, that was my, my role at um, Esri was to work on environmental health and get examples from folks. Um, so one example that I heard about that, and I don't, I'm, I was trying to remember, maybe it's San Luis Obispo, but it's a county that's actually in California, um, and they actually have someone who filters through. So they actually have a staff who filters through, and then they do, and and they filter through lightly, and they're working. They were working on building an algorithm just to make sure that they're not over filtering, but making sure like if there's cuss words or things that don't pertain, which sometimes happens with public comment, um, that those would be excluded, but otherwise they just let everything be posted. And they actually had it, have it, and I'm almost positive at San Luis Obispo, but they have it posted so that way you can see where the folks live around the community because they have the option to put in their zip code if they want to. So that, that was a way to actually build it into a GIS so that way folks can see real live discussions. Great, thank you. All right, uh, let's see, Dr. Gill, how would you gauge a, the effectiveness um, of interventions in reducing health disparities? Great question. I mean, the interventions, you know, again, depend on the population. And when you can kind of stratify the population and, and you know, need versus not need, you can then address the issues, um, you know, in NEHA. And then the RFM study, we we really basically did a needs assessment, um, you know, on population. And what we were able to identify, even in that example, is areas where training needs are needed, you know, across the nation. Um, so, and and that can be applicable to any 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 type of data or any population. So, I would say a needs assessment uh, would first be the first aspect um, that will tell us what intervention needs to be completed, and then after that. What areas um, geographically can can be represented um, to address um, the need, um, and and in in the RFFM study we did that needs assessment and we were able to address training needs. So um, that was that was great to see um, which which parts of the United States need not just need but want uh, information easily. Uh, let's see. Uh, maybe you can all jump in on this one. What key metrics and data sources do you employ in your work to assess and monitor community health, particularly in relation to envir environmental factors? I'll jump in. Uh, CDC data has been useful. Um, you know, there's been that site, uh, NORS data. We tried to explore that um, as far as NIA and NORS data. I'm referring to the National Outbreak Reporting System. Um, you know, some so federal federal data sources are great. Some of the state ones, 
um, are uh, useful as well when, when encompassing that kind of data. But again, it always starts with the collection aspect. So these inspectors who go out there and get that information and provide it, they're, they're, they're instrumental. And I'll add on there, NOAA has has some really great data sets that, of course, are used a lot um, with the camera portal, which everyone would have access to. It's for the feds, but also I've heard of multiple states using it in order to look at heat indexes in order to identify where to put cooling centers. Um, so that's another big part. Uh, and in a much more smaller community level, we actually had um, local data collected by youth to go out and take pictures of different areas where they saw this is an environmental scan, so it's very um, community based, um, but to get the youth engaged for where they saw tobacco butts and things like that in order to think about where to put disposal stations. So there's whether we're talking really macro, like being able to see what's going on with our weather, um, where I live right now, it's in Chico, California, where the campfire was. And so there's a lot of data that we use with Cal Fire as well as with NOAA and some other agencies that we put together in order to identify um, areas where we might want to set up shelters when there's during fire season. I was going to say that we use um, Esri's software um, for ArcGIS Online. We use the um, Living Atlas, also the Washington Department of Health um, environmental data, and also state data. There's also data um, from the Puget Sound Region Council, and also the CDC. We use a lot of their data too. Uh, let's see, I have somebody who is working in spatiotemporal analysis and mapping of environmental pollution and asthma disease in Nigeria, uh, wondering if there's any way we can synergize. Uh, so anybody working on asthma or pollution? Have any comments on that? Uh, how do you deal with constantly changing census tracts? See, Dr. Gill has. I, I smiled because uh, <laughs> that's what they, they change all the time. Um, so, I mean, that's where I think we got to give a shout out to Esri again. They're able to identify yearly information when it changes. Um, and if they don't, they know it's updated. They will, you got to contact their team and they will try to address that. And they've been good at that. So um, I've had to do that. If you have census level data that changes, please just contact Esri. They'll try to help you out. Um, that's what has worked for me that changes per year to year. Here's a question that we've kind of been working on in the informatics committee all year. Uh, EH related data is resting with, with different agencies. Any efforts to collate big data, big data sets uh, to providing the everything related to EH? You know, we've been looking at uh, creating uh, kind of general standards for vector data. Uh, they're kind of all, all over the place out there. Anybody else working on anything like that to bring all the agency data together? I'll just go, oh, I was going to repeat what Dr. Gill said about going back to Esri because those are the kind of projects that they absolutely love and that they, when they know that there's a need, that's why when camera was created, it was just an ask. So it's the same kind of thing, but it's focused with a little bit different indicators. And so I know that there's a really big need um, for this kind of uh, this kind of suppository for environmental health indicators. So I would just, if multiple people are asking Esri, I think they'll build it. Perfect. But I was going to say at a county level, um, a lot of different counties and statewide, they do utilize the open data portal and you are able to go there to search for data, download data, and be able to incorporate it into your maps. So that right there has been extremely helpful. All right, perfect. Well, um, if anybody else has any additional questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, any of our panelists have any final words before I toss it back to Nicole. We really appreciate all your input today. And as the questions continue to come in, we will try and uh, help answer those either online or um, in person. So Nicole, I'm gonna send it back to you. 
Great. Thank you, Carla. All right, let me pull up my slides for all of you. I will move forward with uh, a few announcements. All right, so uh, this year, NEHA is holding our annual education conference in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Give me one second. A registration for the annual educational conference is currently open. And uh, you can find that information about the conference at www.neha.org forward slash AEC. And I also wanted to announce NEHA's private water network is celebrating its five-year anniversary. Uh, there is no fee to become a member. So if you work or are studying private water and or septic systems and on-site wastewater, please join us. Uh, scanning the QR, QR code here on your screen will take you directly to the application. And at this time, I would like to share that all of you in the audience today will receive a prompt or an email to take an evaluation survey to provide your feedback and comments and any additional questions that you may have for our speakers and panelists. Um, please do complete the survey. It will only take a few minutes of your time. We value what is shared in the evaluations and do use it to help improve and meet the needs of our current and future workforce. And lastly, I would like to thank our speakers, Serene Ong and Andrew Mackey for their awesome presentation today. And our expert panelists, Kanita Sellers, Dr. Gagandeep Gill and Nanette Starr for their insight and knowledge on GIS systems. And thank you to all of you who joined us today. I hope you all enjoyed today's Grand Rounds Optimizing Environmental Public Health Practice with Geographic Information Systems. Uh, Carla, did I hear you chime in? Did you want to add something? I was just going to read uh, Nan Oops, sorry. Uh, I was just going to read Nanette's uh, chat that she put in the box in case people aren't looking at it. It says there are many more examples with using GIS to drive policy decisions in housing, air quality, and other factors. I encourage everyone to keep sharing with your policy officials as you create and implement GIS to help improve and track the health of your communities. Thanks, Nanette. Great. Thank you all. Have a wonderful rest of your day and I hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Goodbye.